if it's known to everyone here that WikiLeaks was not just established a year ago, but that WikiLeaks has been around for a handful of years at this point, at least I think five years, four or five years, and they've been releasing information. I think one of the questions is, is the difference now that with that, the technology that WikiLeaks has created and, and encouraged um, the use of, um, is there <laughs> basically a difference in the quantity of um, documents that can be released and the speed at which that can be made um, publicly available. Um, also, obviously, it's produced um, quite significant debate about uh, the role of whistleblowers um, in society. Um, certainly in the United States, there's been lots of debate about um, you know, who is a journalist, what is a journalist, um, and amongst um, some in government, um, questions about uh, whether there should be room to prosecute um, uh, those who have uh, made secondary disclosures of information. Um, obviously, there's the, the, the person suspected of having made the primary disclosures, Bradley Manning, is still awaiting prosecution after quite some time in, um, in jail. Um, and I just wanted to highlight on the question of, of WikiLeaks a statement that was released in December of last year um, by, by Frank LaRue and the Inter-American Commission um, uh, of Human Rights Special Rapporteur Catalina Botero, Catalina Botero, which highlights um, a, a few sort of principles that can be made applicable um, to WikiLeaks um, and that are sort of the, the fundamental principles that in, in some ways are represented within the principles here, but also within um, within other principles that I discussed, but also within some, some other documents, um, including the, the priority of the government um, to protect the confidentiality of legitimately classified information, um, uh, but also um, not a, as a legal obligation, but a journalistic responsibility that's urged um, when reporting may affect fundamental rights, because one of the questions that has come up quite a bit is what is the obligation of both WikiLeaks and the um, and the newspapers and media outlets that are publishing information to protect the confidentiality of sources. So. Thank you. How do uh, we get professional services? Yeah, I just want to say one thing about WikiLeaks. I've been reading through and through and through. There's nothing there that's actually revealed anything of major national significant security and danger. Yeah. Um, it, it's a more lower level, middle level type of information and it's been very embarrassing for a lot of states, no less Palestinian authority and the Palestinian papers, etc. Embarrassing for personalities in this country who love to talk to ambassadors <laughs> who write brilliantly. People have laughed about their ambassadors and their messages home. And you know how people like to talk about the Americans. <laughs> and you read what an American or whoever the ambassador is writing home, and they've got it absolutely correct and in very elegant language. But it's going to mean that the whole of diplomacy is going to have to change in terms of how they write their telegrams. And one very good thing is those who go particularly to Western embassies and start talking and gossiping <laughs> about their politicians. And these are politicians who want to ask politicians, as we've seen in this country, will really have to think again. So it's a wonderful watershed. But sorry to take up that time. On this question of uh, teaching countries that have been under dictatorship, authoritarian regimes of Eastern Europe or Asia, Africa, etc. You know, whether it is the security, the defense sector, or whether it's something I've been involved in, water, forestry, the environmental factors, and I'm not putting Western agencies down at all. They're doing a lot of good, and the whole question of good governance summed up, which sums up a lot of the papers and the policy that gets presented. Very useful. But what is on paper, from constitutional niceties and principles down to practice and regulations, can so easily be ignored and obfuscated and with the use of secrecy, pulling the wool over people's eyes, etc., etc. That this question that I highlighted 
the ethic, the culture, the ethos that one wants to create in a new, newly liberated or democratic society, country, is so imperative. I came up against aspects in my intelligence service that shocked me of the abuse of their resources and power for political ends to support particular political factions. And as a result, in dealing with this, I realized there was a total lack of a healthy cultural ethos. And I issued uh, documents about this, I gave lectures, I got debates going within the service. They were petrified of talking. And, uh, you know, there was one question of bending the rules, can the rules be bent? Uh, which revealed so much of the attitudes. And I then put it all in a nutshell in terms of the principles of professionalism. Now, whether you're working in water or forestry or in the police or defence, in, in intelligence, you're a serious person, you really take seriously your prof pride in your professionalism, which means your work craft, the so-called spy craft in intelligence, etc., that trade craft, and that's got to be improved. Skills have to be honed. Countries assist in that. I don't want to say Western countries as such. It happened here with our Defence Force. Um, but you've got to have an educational program taking place. And we brought in, it's been totally thrown out since, uh, since I resigned. So these things, if you don't have the culture, it can't rely on one, if I can say, good minister or not. <laughs> it's got to be so inculcated that people believe in it. And what they believe is so good is that helps them with their trade craft and their pride in it. And amongst the principles is that we're not above the law. We serve the people. And yes, the government of the day. But we don't perpetuate what our friend from Morocco was saying. This question of national security is of the people. Not the security of some elite or a family in power. Which is where we see so much going wrong. And we even saw that within our own intelligence service today. You've been here some time. You can see the latest episode is a huge blow-up in the South African intelligence services between the minister and the three direct generals of different arms of, of those services. It it's really undermines national security. It's not stars who are doing it, it's the very practitioners, and it's government interference, politically speaking. So we said political non-partisanship. These type of principles. Great, thank you. And can we learn from the 260 years? I have another the... question. My question concerns Sweden. Hold on, one Could it come in maybe before? Because you would have answered to that. Let me do it first. Okay. Can we learn from Sweden? I mean, the original 1766 Act on Freedom of the Press was a response to corruption at the time, to political changes that, that tried to, to uh, from one faction of, the, of one government to another government. And it's become our history, everyone's history. Are we all going to become Sweden in 260 years? <laughs> well, I, 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 it's, it's hard to answer that question because, I mean, how, how we, various parts of the world develop, I, 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 it, it's very, very hard to say. I, I just think there are elements of such a regulation which are, first of all, possible to apply basically everywhere if, if, if there is a political will. And secondly, that may be of, of use in order to avoid certain of the problems that have been discussed here and, and, and uh, yeah, I don't think there is any country that could stand as a role model for any other, for, for other parts of the world as such, but the idea is, as you say, to fight corruption through transparency, through an open public administration, as such, I think is good, I think it's possible to apply basically okay. anyway. Kurt, Ronnie, you wanted to say something quick and then we'll get to the questions. Thanks, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm abusing the position here. So very short, because you mentioned Sweden, 
And I want to come back now to why you need good professional security and a good security regime that knows its business. Because they were too lax in Sweden, and as a result, their most outstanding Prime Minister, Olaf Palm, was assassinated in the streets with no protection. And talking about Scandinavia, we've all been horrified at what happened in Oslo. Again, no security. And in this day and age where there are all sorts of nutters around, homegrown nutters, never mind Al-Qaeda, who get so bamboozled by cults and egos and the like, products of this postmodern world, if we use that phrase, I've never quite understood what it meant, but <laughs> these characters who will go and butcher people. So it does remind us of, you know, where is the actual need? And it is very important. And it does come back to our, our brother from Morocco, and I, I love the way he talked about national security and the serving of the people. But that also means the protection in a real sense of, of leadership. Not making a cult of them, as has been the case in so many Middle Eastern and or African countries, or the Eastern European Communist bloc. Thanks. So we're going to take a few questions. Yes, I wanted to tell you a story. Can you hear me? It's going from, to be a very short story, though. Yes, from <laughs> Sweden, about our own WikiLeaks, which we had... Uh, Notwithstanding these 200 years ago, when in the time of Olof Palme, two journalists dis uncovered that the Swedish Social Democratic Party had a spy organization of their own and used it to spy on the left. These journalists were not on the payroll of any country. But regardless of that, they were finally sentenced for espionage and they got several, well they got one or two years, I think one got one year and one got two years. And uh, of course you could say that uh, this is, uh, I mean a country has to protect itself from enemies. But the principal thing is, and I think it could apply, if you excuse me, Ronnie Casrails, to South Africa, where you also had a leading party, which was dominating and thought that the interests of the party were the interests of the state. So uh, this is the question. I mean, how far can you go? And uh, I mean, you from Uruguay, you, I don't know how old you were, at this time, I mean, for my generation of journalists, and I was working on this, it took away our faith in the Social Democrats for quite some time. Uh, before you ask, we'll ask a few more questions. Toby had one, and then back there, and you, uh, we'll do four, and then we'll go some more. Toby? Thank you. I have a question and a quick comment. Um, yeah. So my question is uh, to uh, the Swedish gentleman. Um, this idea of responsible editor, and I know it's also in place in Germany, and I can see how that would work in a newspaper context where there's a clear editorial process and at least